on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. It makes the story more interesting because it's not just information being narrated to them. It somewhat activates their own emotions and ever that's what we, we read for. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Uh, haircuts, Mark Dawson, if you're watching on YouTube. Finally, post-lockdown, you had to yes. queue. We all had to queue. <laughs> yeah, I eventually got... Two weeks to get in there, but um, I've I've never I've never been quite so bearded, or quite so much like stick in the dump. So I'm very 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 pleased to have had my hair cut. It's taken years off you. It has it has literally taken years off me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, and your ears. Good. Uh, well, welcome to the show. We've got a few things to get through today before we get on to our interview with Becca Puglisi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome our new Patreon supporters. A very warm welcome indeed to Stephanie Giancola from New Hampshire in the United States. Uh, to Adam Fike from California in the USA and also in the USA from Idaho, Joshua Wold. They all went to uh, patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and they are the last, I think, of the intake who are eligible uh, for uh, a spell in the book laboratory. So at some point in the next 48 hours, Mark, the entries will be passed over to you for you to choose somebody to go into the lab next time. Then we'll get Jenny and Stuart and Brian on to dissect and take apart what they've put forward. Um, good. Well, I should probably just say that I've launched my book um, in the last couple of weeks. So we've mentioned that from time to time, and I'm now in a kind of post-launch strategy. Um, so I settled down. I've been quite pleased with the way it settled down, actually. So the last three days, which I think I've moved through that initial my SPF friends buying the book um, period, uh, I have sold between 15 and 20 books a day. That uh, is about uh, 40 to 50 pounds a day of income. And I'm spending about that a little bit more on ads. So typically yesterday I spent 50 uh, pounds, which is what, $65, something like that, uh, on ads, on Facebook ads and Amazon ads. And I made 44.90, so 45 pounds in return. So effectively, I'm running at a loss of about five pounds a day. But that's before I've really optimized the ads. And I did a bit of that this morning. So I might be able to bring that back to even. But I'm thinking that's okay at the moment. This book is about visibility, about getting my name out there. It's also giving it a chance. I mean, I have no idea whether this is a book that people are going to like and recommend to their friends, but it gives it a chance if it is going to be a grower like that by getting it in front of people and getting it sold and read. So I would be happy, honestly losing a few pounds a day for weeks on end, frankly, to get the book out there, build an audience and quickly, as quickly as I possibly can, write book two and get that out there. So that seems to be my strategy at the moment. If I can break even, it would be better, ideally. Yeah, you've got to, I know people will be listening, will be, some people won't get that and will think that it's crazy that you're actually losing money on something that you just put out there. And I think that's that's a reasonable position. But as long as you know what your objective is uh, and you, you're you keeping a tight eye on um, what type hand on on the actual amount that you're you're spending and, and losing, then it's OK. Um, I don't think it's, you know, as a, as a new author, you're not likely to make money on the first um, the first book when you advertise it because there isn't anything else to go on, but you are building an audience. And I'm doing something similar with the Atticus books at the moment. So although there's, you know, I've I've written 40 books, I suppose, in total, something like that now, um, there's only two in the Atticus series. And I am, um, I think I've probably mentioned this before, the, the first one is 99 pence and 99 cents at the moment. It has been for about six weeks. And I'm really hammering that with ads at the moment. So probably spending $150 a day across UK and US on on that and definitely making a loss. Absolutely. Maybe selling 100 a day. So at, at you know, 35 cents, I'm probably making 60 or $70 a day in terms of loss, maybe, maybe more than that. But there is another book that follows after, which is a full price book. Um, and that is still selling really strongly um so you know i look at my book report every morning and that is always the number one book ahead of all the miltons ahead of beatrix isabella um 
And I think when they're all, I haven't really done my numbers for this month's ads, ads yet, but I think when I sit down and look at it, it, I won't be that surprised if I'm making a small profit um, on that. But it, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally mind too much making a loss on this one on the basis that there will be four or five Atticus books in a year or two, and I'm building an audience of police procedural fans who and, and detective story fans who might not necessarily be the ones who are more likely to buy the Milton books, although there is some crossover. I'm building a new audience, and you have to invest to do that sometimes. Yeah, it's obviously um, early days for me, but it would require very... If I if I had a second book out now, it would require very little read-through for that to be a profitable campaign, which is optimistic for the future if I can keep this, mm -hmm. keep this going. Um, yeah, and uh, I had my first few reviews in, so a few five stars possibly from people I, whose names I recognize. And I've had two four-star reviews. G, G Blatch? <laughs> no, G Blatch hasn't left a review, I don't think. Well, she, <laughs> if she has, it hasn't been accepted, hasn't appeared. Um, G, G stands for, for those who don't know, G, G is Jill. That's James's wife. But two people have clicked four stars. It's okay. What's wrong with, what's wrong with the book? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Um, obviously, I'm doing all this for the first time and all these emotions that I've seen people go through, I'm now experiencing, which is fun. And I'm really pleased to be at this point. I'm even on the Joanna Penn podcast this afternoon, which I think is this kind of royalty status. You are I mean, obviously to be on this. What's she going to talk to you about? I think she wants some tips on writing <laughs> and a qu on quick fire release. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> Rapid yeah. publishing. Yeah, my God, that's going to be interesting. I don't know if she's got to lay herself in for. Yeah, uh, so I'm not sure when that's going to go out, probably in the next few weeks. I think Joe records a few, three or four weeks in advance. Um, good, okay. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things to mention. If you're in the Ads for Authors course this week, hopefully by the time this podcast goes out on Friday, there will be a new module in Facebook Ads for Authors authored by me. It's module five, and that is on dynamic creative ads. So we go through uh, what they are, how to set them up, how to optimize them, how to use them, uh, when you should be using them, when you should be doing everything manually. Uh, we we'll talk about all of that. But I'm I'm a big fan of dynamic creative ads. I use them a lot, uh, particularly for that early data uh, when you're trying to work out what works and what doesn't, which is key to really getting ads um, efficiently working for you. So that module should be live on Friday. Can't see any reason why it wouldn't be now. Um, what else we got to say, Mark? We've got our launches uh, course, which is still ongoing, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash launches. Um, that's a paid course. It's 20 bucks, but um, well, 19 it's less than 20 bucks. Uh, and that's gone really well. The feedback's been fantastic on that course. And um, uh, yeah, I, I see who's people the driving into it every day. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's right. M. Dawson. Yes, <laughs> it's a good uh, course. Though. A I've good been course. I've been meaning to do it for ages. It's it was quite you know it's about a week's worth of work. Um, so it's three hours. It's not a short course, and there's there's things downloadable timetables and um, ad copy and ads and things like that with, with numbers. And I'm also doing I'm going to do uh, kind of live updates in the Facebook group when I launch the next Milton book, which will be you know, quite interesting, I think. So that's, um, that's good. There, and if, you know, there is an offer on that one. And if you go to the Facebook group, uh, self-publishing former community, you can, you can do a little search. You should find there's a offer for UK authors. Um, who want to take that course and that will end on Friday. So head over to the Facebook group to find out about that. Well, this goes out on Friday. So basically you've got to listen to it and head to the Facebook yes, group on Friday. That'd be, I think probably be okay for the weekend, but yeah, don't, don't hang yeah. about. Okay. Okay, great. Well, that brings us on to our interview, Mark. And this is Becca Puglisi. I don't know if you've met Becca or know Becca. No, I don't. No. Interesting. So I didn't know a lot about Becca before, and I should have probably done more research than I did because she is the co-author of a book that lots of you will be familiar with, The Emotional Thesaurus for Writers. And the more I look into it, the more I like this book and seen how successful it's been as well. So it's opened my eyes a little bit to uh, an area of our writing uh, that it could be very helpful with, which is basically showing and not telling and how to do that, keeping it fresh and to help you um, show somebody's angry rather than tell the, the reader that they're angry using the language helpfully put together in these lists. So let's, uh, let's hear from Becca, hear a little bit about her writing as well. And then Mark and I will be back for a quick chat off the back of the interview. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Becca, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. Thank you so much. Super excited. I didn't throw myself into your surname. Pook. 
You better you better say it. <laughs> it's Puglisi. Puglisi. That's easy. It's it's easier than it looks. Yes. For some reason, it's very intimidating. I don't know why. Is that Italian? It's yes. Puglisi. Sounds like a Clearly, nice... I married into the Italian surname. I yeah. can't claim it really okay. for myself. Well, it sounds like a nice wine. Should we have a Puglisi tonight? <laughs> or a pizza? Anyway, um, great. So uh, lovely to have you with us, Beck. I'm excited about this conversation because we don't talk, we haven't talked sort of craft for a, a while on the show. Ooh. And yet it's the one thing we all love to talk about the whole time. And I want to talk to you yeah. about emotion in characters and in your book. Uh, particularly, I think I'm going to ask some male type questions because we tend to be unemotional story mechanics people and we sort of forget the reason people are reading the book actually it's not that it's not because the guy goes from a to b it's y and all that stuff so we'll talk a bit about that right. later and uh, also want to hear a little bit about you and your background uh, but first whereabouts are you becca in the world oh i'm in um florida in oh, okay. the us oh yes i think i read you're in jupiter yep which is where all the golfers live right Lots of golf, lots of tennis. Um, there's a, a Lockheed Martin is a um, a spacecraft air flight engine production company. So oh, that's Lockheed Martin, really big yes. here. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So that's it. That's Jupiter. Golf and space sounds like my kind of place. I have to <laughs> just drop into Jupiter. Which you know, when point. you think Jupiter, I mean, come yes, on. it's, it's the be. perfect place for it's it. Got to be, isn't it? That big gas giant. Okay, that's good. Well, welcome from uh, Jupiter, Florida to uh, actually sunny UK today, strangely. Oh, good. Um, and let's find out a bit about you, Becca. So you're obviously a writer yourself. Tell us a bit about your background. Sure. I grew up not writing at all. Like that was not on my radar. Um, I know I hear stories about people. My son wrote his first story at four. You know, I like have it commemorated for future reference. And that was not me. I was just not that way. Um, but I got into it very late in my, when I was ah, my late 20s. Um, I was teaching first grade and I thought, oh, I can write a picture book. Come on. I mean, like, you know, I've read a million of these. How hard could this be? And, you know, and then I realized how hard it was when I started doing it, yeah. but I loved it and just felt like I had kind of a knack for, for writing. Um, my favorite thing to write is, um, is fantasy and I like historical fiction too. when I have time to do the research. Um, and yeah, that's mostly what I, I prefer to write, but I don't have very much time for that right now because we're writing so many nonfiction books and those are, you know, doing very well. So that's kind of where my time is, is mostly spent. Yeah, great. Um, the, the books you have written, historicals, the fantasy, are they adult or YA or? They're YA. Oh, YA. Um, I just found for some reason, I like the length of it. Um, and I like that it's not that it's simplistic at all. It's just, it's a little less complex for me, um, the YA storylines. And so um, that's actually primarily what I read just because, yep. you know, as a mom and a working mom, it's, it's hard to find time to, to read a, you know, a big, huge, every once in a while, I'll tackle a Stephen King, you know, his latest that's got 800 pages, but um, I like that length. It's good for me. Yeah. Well, I think lots of adults must read YA because it's a, such a huge genre. Yeah. It is very... That, um, that was the cat. my cat. My doorbell's <laughs> gone off and your cat's... But that's right. <laughs> that's life. Right. That's how life works. That's right. Um, yes. Anyway, YA is a huge genre and I, I sort of figure there must be people at least in their up to their 30s, I think, and then maybe doing a little bit, but I think it's probably people read it their whole life. Yeah. And I think that The Hunger Games really kicked that off because... Um, I know I was reading it. I was reading YA long before that. Um, my husband is not like a, a huge reader. And when I read the first Hunger Games book, I said to him, read this book. I know you're not like a huge reader, but this is, you're going to love this book. And he's like, come on, it's like for teenagers. And, and he said, it's the first book he ever read start to finish without being able to stop. He mm. was up to like three in the morning because he just couldn't stop reading it. And I think that a lot of people kind of had that experience and realized, oh my gosh, there are great books in the teen section. And I think that that kind of kickstarted it. But I agree, I have a lot of friends my age who read a lot of YA. So I think yeah. it is very popular for adults too. Well, they do say that you're supposed when you're writing for adults, you're supposed to write for a vocabulary standard that's basically just out of school. So, yep. and I guess that that's probably, if that's the vocabulary level a lot of people are reading at, and I don't mean this in a sniffy way at all. No, no. Um, I think that's I probably it. why YA books work. In fact, I read The Hunger Games, I've read the Harry Potter books. Thinking about it, I probably read quite a lot of uh, books aimed at yep. people younger than me. 
But uh, there you go. Okay, right. So let's talk about what you're doing in terms of nonfiction, in terms of the way that you work with writers, Becca. How did this start? Um, you know, ironically, it grew out of out of my fiction. Um, Angela and I, who I, all of my books are co-written with Angela Ackerman, um, we met as critique partners on a, a site called Critique Circle, critiquecircle.com. It's basically an online um, site where people can come and submit um, chapters of their work or samples of their poetry or whatever it is that they're writing and then people read it and they critique it and then you know you return the favor and and we met there were thousands and thousands of people and we happened to to log in right around the same time and just found each other loved each other's work and started out as as critique partners and as we were um, just uh, reading and learning and, and trying to grow in, in our, our writing journey at the very beginning of that, that journey for both of us, um, I started noticing in my writing that my characters were constantly doing the same things. They were always shrugging or shuffling their feet or frowning. And, and I, I couldn't, I saw the repetition and I couldn't figure out like, how else can I convey these emotions in a way that doesn't sound contrived? And so I started making lists, you know, okay, well, here's some other things that I can do when they're angry or when they're sad or whatever. And I took it to the group and said, do you guys, you know, I don't know if you can use this, but this is something I'm struggling with. And they, every single one of them said, oh my gosh, this is the problem. And I know it's a problem and I can't find anything to help me with it. So we started expanding on these lists and just kind of keeping, um, uh, a tab of all of these different cues for emotions. And over time, everyone kind of, you know, petered out and it was just me and Angela, like charging away on our emotion lists. And that book eventually, of course, became, I mean, th those lists became our, our first book, which was The Emotion Thesaurus. We, um, we started a blog um, about four years later. And Angela, who is, you know, kind of a marketing genius, even though she probably would balk at that term, but she is very intuitive and just has a really good knack for, for um, how to, how to promote. And she said, you know, we need a blog and, and I want some content that's, that it's going to bring people back. You know, it's not just a one time, here's a really good something, or here's a really good something. I, I, let's do something kind of like a serial almost, you know, where every week we put out something new and it's more of the same that we offer before. And she said, we should do those those emotionless, we could call it like an emotion thesaurus. And, you know, every week we'll do one emotion and we'll highlight how people can show it instead of telling it and give them more ideas. And, and so we were like, okay, so, you know, we'll try that. And in a very short time, it just kind of took off. I mean, everybody who was reading those thesaurus entries was like, oh my gosh, this is a problem. I have this problem. And it seemed, we realized it's a universal problem for writers that figuring out how to show the character's emotion in a way that's really going to resonate with the reader yeah. is very difficult. It's it's not intuitive. Our first impulse is to just tell it and say it, you know, he was mad or she was angry or to use the same kind of cliched phrases, you know, that we've seen over and over again. Damn it. Um, and uh, so we just decided to, um, to do that and it, it really it really resonated with people and you know they started saying when <laughs> when is this going to be a book i'd really like to have a book when i'm working and so we thought okay, okay well wasn't thinking about that but okay that's a great idea and that's really how we we got started was that was kind of the the evolution so let me take you back to those original lists you did can you give me can you describe them a little bit more so i'm having a hard time visualizing this list. Yeah, it was like, okay, um, anger. So I know my character is going to be angry sometime in my story. What are some things that he can do with his body that's going to show the reader that he's angry? Okay, so he can clench his fists, but you know, he's already doing that a million times. Um, he could, um, you know, if he's a confrontational kind of person, he might make himself bigger and like and get in people's space. His voice is going to change to reflect um, that he's angry. He might start interrupting people. Um, he might start actually go on the offensive and start picking a, a verbal fight with the person. Um, and those are just all the kind of outward cues yeah. that we naturally do as people. And if we can apply those to our characters, then the character's emotion becomes very obvious to the reader without us having to stop the narrative and explain yeah. what the emotion is. And it just brings the reader in a little bit closer because they've experienced all of those things. They recognize intuitively, oh, I know that, you know, I, I have felt that before. I know what that means. And they're not obviously consciously going through that process, but 
on a subconscious level, they recognize that feeling and those, those cues. And so it just makes the, the character much more authentic and pulls the reader more firmly into the character's experience, immersing them into the story instead of putting them at a distance, just sitting back, listening to somebody tell them what the character is feeling. They're kind of going through it with them. Yeah. God, that's such a good idea. I mean, how many times has an editor said to me, show me this, don't tell me that they're angry. And there you've got a list of things to do for your character. So I always think I've worked a lot with editors on my, my first book and you know, the one thing I am really learning here is it is it's got to prompt that in the reader's mind. You've got yes. to have the reader get to it themselves. You can't. It may, It's a boring book if you ever tell the reader what they should be thinking is going to right. happen. It's got to be prompted there. And so to have that list of things to help you do that, even if it's just the start of writing that scene, how am I going to right. know this person's angry? Presumably you cover the gamut of emotions. Yeah, we our first book we had seventy, um, and then it was so seventy populated. emotions. I'm trying to think how many emotions can there be. I know, right? Well, it was it it did really well, and then we we just released a second edition like a year and a half ago, where we expanded it. Now we have 130 emotions. You know, it's it's everything from uh, amusement, bitterness, confusion, defensiveness, suspicion, um, moodiness. You know, just every possible uh, emotion along that range. But it's just, it's so, so important because emotion is what pulls readers in. And if we can't trigger our readers' emotions with our stories, very likely they're not gonna be drawn into the stories and they're not going to be um, captivated by them. So one way to do that very well is to get them connecting with the character's emotion. And that's that's really why the show don't tell portion of the emotion piece for the character, it, it does multiple things. I mean, it, it makes the story more interesting because it's not just information being narrated to them, but it also actually, it, it somewhat activates their own emotions. And ever that's what we, we read for. You know, we have a lot of different reasons why we read, but people want to have an experience when they're reading. They might want to be excited. They might want to be scared. They might want to be um, satisfied with, you know, a, a, a romantic kind of a, a situation resolving satisfactorily at the end of the story. But we all want to connect in some way. Um, we want to have an experience, an emotional experience when we read. And one of the best ways to do that is to show the character's emotion so that the reader gets it crystal clear. So what, what, what have you done with those originalists? I know you talked about the thesaurus. So how, is that a book or how does that work? Yeah, so we, we took all the lists and we made it into a book, The Emotion Thesaurus. And each, there's some, um, in the front is, is instructive matter on how to show emotion. So there's different um, chapters on how you can use dialogue to write emotion, um, how you can use um, different physical cues. And we talk about subtext, you know, which is huge in our interactions with each other, how we're not always honest and we're usually kind of holding back and hedging a little bit. And if we can, show that that nuance with our characters they're just going to be much more realistic and relatable to the people who are reading them so the front half of the book well, not the front half um just the front section is all information on here's how you show emotion why it's important here's how you do it and then the bulk of the book is is two page spreads that have an emotion and it talks about physical signals and behaviors you can use with your character that's just the things that they're physically doing with their body internal sensations that if you're, you know, in their uh, perspective, if you're using a, a first person viewpoint, you can tell what's happening internally inside of them, what their mental responses might be. Um, we have a section on signs that the emotion is being suppressed. So if, you know, a lot of emotions we're not comfortable sharing and it's, it adds a layer of authenticity when we show a character who is fearful, trying kind of to hide that. Um, because it makes them feel vulnerable or it makes them look weak or whatever the reason is that they may not be comfortable showing their emotion. And it just, it's very, very simple. I mean, it's its a two page spread for each emotion. And wow. it's not really meant to, you know, to go through and pull out lines and insert them into no. a story. Because when we do that, then those lines be start becoming cliche. And, and it's also not specific to the character. And that's what we really want is to, everything that the character is doing needs to be very specific to who they are. So we encourage people to use it as a brainstorming tool to look through and get new ideas and then think, okay, I can use this one. My I can see my character reacting in this way when he's feeling this way. 
um, I'm, you know, I'm going to tweak this a little bit to make it more specific to who he is. And that's, um, that's really how it works. I can find that. I can see straight away how useful that is. I think particularly because we write so much quicker today than I think people used to write. I mean, you read these old stories of Hemingway or whoever who agonized for a week over a sentence. And <laughs> right. I've cut, although I have probably done that, I do yeah. like the idea of sitting there all day with this one paragraph trying to get it exactly it's right. Funny. But most of the time mm -hmm. you're in the scene, you know they're angry or, or sad, and you think for a moment about how to show that and what they're going to do, but you're really writing the scene. You've got to get the scene done. You've got to move on. And yeah. then maybe your next revision, you're going to make that better. But right. it's going to be much better all around, isn't it, if you have a little aid to help you at that yeah. stage to flesh that out. Uh, an early and we point. found that the more the more you do it, the more you you practice this showing of emotion, the more natural it becomes. Uh, you know, and initially, like you said, it is more of a revision technique because you're just getting the information down on the page, and then you go back. And I know people who have put notes in their um, in their manuscript. You know, show this emotion or or expand on this emotion in later revision passes, but. What it does when you start practicing this process is that you start kind of making your own database, your own lists of emotions. You know, you're looking at people and you're seeing the way that they respond. You're watching TV or watching movies, which the actor's getting paid to show you what this character's feeling. You know, so it's a great way to to find new and and specific ways of of showing a certain emotion that you can then transfer, you know, to your own writing. The more you do that, the more you just start to expand past that that first response that we're all we all have. You know, when my character's angry, I automatically go to this, and it starts. You just start to grow past that. Um, the more you do it, honestly, the easier it does become. It just becomes much more natural. Yeah, as you say, there can only be so much fist clenching you can have <laughs> right. in one book, and your editor's going to pick that up anyway. Um, thinking about it, this is a great manual for actors, isn't it? You mentioned acting there, but I mean, that's what they do, right? They get the script in black and white on a sheet. And, you know, some directors, I think it's um, George Lucas famously almost says nothing to his actors. Right. Uh, Tom, uh, what's his name? Ron Howard works very closely as a former actor with mm. his actors saying, well, let's let's try moving physically to, together or whatever, seeing some of those workshops he does. But a lot of the time, actors have got to do exactly what we're describing writers having to do. If that's a really good way yeah. of thinking about it, is if you were directing a film right in this scene, what would your stage cues be to the actor and then write that down to make that happen? I can imagine actors flicking through that book thinking, he's angry in this scene. What physical, what physicality am I going to bring to it? And you've already answered some of those questions for them. Yeah, I, I think that would be awesome. We haven't heard from a lot of, of actors. Um, we actually, ironically, we get... Um, a fair amount of emails from from psychologists and therapists um, who who are, have found it and are using it like with their their clients on the autism spectrum who um, have a hard time identifying emotions in other people, and they're able to kind of study you know the major emotions that they see on a regular basis and recognize oh you know this person is frustrated with me or or this person is sad or and, and that was like incredibly validating like so yeah. exciting to see it being used um you know on that kind of a level on a personal level with people outside of their career just you know and helping them to relate to people and um somebody told us that she was using it with a an addiction uh an addiction therapy group with uh people who had eating disorders because she was using certain emotion entries to help them see because they're, uh, her, her clients are being triggered by certain emotions and then they would, they would binge, you know, when they were feeling that emotion. And if they can just identify the emotion before it, it really gets started, then they can take steps to cope and to, to keep it from progressing to the next level. And so just hearing like, you know, stories like that, it's amazing to think that, that this book is, is helping people on such a practical day-to-day -day level. It's really yeah. kind of awesome. So when did you release the book the first time? Uh, 2012. Was the first edition. Gosh, it's a few years old now. Mm -hmm. You did this work back then. Okay. And how's it gone? Uh, it's great. Uh, it really, we have seven books now in this series of different sources that tackle different areas of, of descriptive writing. 
And this one is, is easily the most popular. It just still manages to outsell each individual book. Um, and I think it's just so universal. Like I said, everybody at some point has to come to grip with this. Um, so it's just something that, that most writers can use. And what are the other books then? Well, when we finished this one, um, we thought, okay, wow, well, that was, <laughs> that was exciting. Uh, what else can we do that um, can help writers? And so we went back to our own writing and thought, you know, where do I struggle? What do I need help with? And the next logical thing that we both noticed we were having a problem with was characterization, was creating these characters that are fully fledged. You know, they're not cardboard, they're not two-dimensional. Uh, they have a mixture of positive and negative traits that all make sense together um, so that you can create an authentic character that, that just reads as real to, uh, to readers. So that was what we tackled next. And we actually put out a two volume set with that. We have a book on negative traits and a book on positive traits. And the front matter in that is actually really interesting because it, it goes into where traits come from and how they form so that... I think a lot of writers, when we're creating characters, we start out creating the characters that we like or that are interesting to us, maybe because they have these traits that we really admire um, or these traits that are really quirky and kind of off the wall and it makes them unusual, but there's really no basis for them. And so they don't really read as, as truly authentic. But when you can look at, okay, what has happened to my character? Like, why might they be this certain way? Um, what positive traits might help them in the story to achieve their story goal. I want to make sure that they have some positive traits that are going to serve the story in that way, or what flaws might trip them up and make things more difficult and create more conflict for them throughout the story and craft your, your characters um, in a more well-rounded way that, that looks at the character, but also looks at the story. And that's really what we focused on with those two books. And, and it's the same exact format. You know, it's got some front matter in the front that talks about where these traits come from and how you can show that your character is impulsive or controlling or cowardly or whatever it is, instead of telling it. And that's an element that's in all of our books is how do we show this instead of tell it. Um, and then the rest of the book is, again, entries, two page spread that tells you uh, how to show that information for your character. I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who finds it much easier to write the good qualities for your heroes and the bad qualities for your baddies, sure. but struggles yeah. to write the flaws and the bad qualities of your heroes and the redeeming features of your baddies. Yeah, Because you do Absolutely. it from the beginning, you set this person up to be the baddie and this hero and you're not really thinking about that that rounded dimension that you're talking about. So important though. Yeah. And I think that that is, again, that's kind of where we all start. You know, this is my good guy and I really admire him and I like him and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make him unlikable. So here are his, all of his good qualities. And if he has a bad quality, it's going to be something really minor, like, you know, he's yeah. messy or, or something, yeah. but. Which is cute. Um, yeah, right. Exactly. So it does, it's really important. And this is important for, you know, I've, I've, written a thriller but this is important in every genre right you you could write sweet romance and some of those books can be the reader has very specific expectations of what's going to happen when it's going to happen but within that you still have to have a hero who can't be perfect right right so this is an important right. thing for every writer to understand these these layers yeah absolutely and it 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 really ties in should tie in so much to to character arc right i mean we have characters they enter our story a certain way. And there are certain things that they have to accomplish or overcome through in this, throughout the story in order to be successful. And it's a matter of figuring out, you know, what those problem areas are that they're usually blind to in the beginning, or they recognize them and they, they see them kind of as a, a strength. You know, well, this is, I know that I'm stubborn, but you know, it's a good thing and it protects me in this way. Um, and then it turns out being, you know, their Achilles heel that they have to, they have to deal with. Um, that's a huge part of characterization is figuring out who your characters are, but knowing why they are that way and how that is going to play into the story. Um, and we explored that more to jump ahead in a, a much later book on emotional wounds that look at ugh, all, all the different traumatic things that could happen to your character in the past and how that can transform them into who they are at the start of your story. 
so that all of those flaws and even some of the positive traits, they make sense because they're coming out of this event from their past and the things, the way that they were raised or something specific that happened to them, so many different possibilities. Um, they, they engender new character traits and the person, the character who they are at the start of your story is gonna be a result of what happened in their past. And as they go through the story, the reader's able to see, you know, pretty much exactly what they're gonna have to be able to, to kind of deal with and overcome. And so when they get to the end and they finally overcome, if they're, if they're successful, I mean, they may, have a, they may have a failed arc where they end in a tragedy and, you know, those stories can be satisfactory too. Um, but it all, it, it all the characterization, the characters' uh, personality traits are, are hugely important to that. And they come very often out of, of events from their past. That's how we are as people. You yeah. know, why I have the traits that I have today is partly because of the way I was raised, partly because of the, the influencers in my life, positive and negative, um, partly because of certain key things that happened to me at, at different times in my life. And that's, again, it, it all goes back to authenticity and making our characters as much like real people as we can yeah and you talked earlier about this being um perhaps lending itself to the revision process typically when we might go back and fill some of this stuff in it seems to me this would be a good thing to have right from the beginning is this how you'd recommend using these books well you know this is what i love is that you can you can kind of use them both ways you know i find that um People who are newer to the writing process, um, they they use them in advance because they're training. You know, they're learning beforehand. Okay, this is how I need to write this, and this is the research I need to do on my character. Um, and then you have other people who are a little more uh, pantser rather than plotter. You know, and they don't want to put in a whole bunch of time up front researching everything, and they're going to use it more on the back end. So it really can be used however you need them to be used, you know, whatever works with your process. But do you have a recommended way of working or do you think that does vary well, as you say? I do think that the backstory pieces, the, um, the emotional wounds and to a certain degree, the character traits, those things need to be figured out beforehand. I really do believe that your, your story is going to be stronger if you're able to, to kind of get that figured out. And again, there are various degrees of this. I mean, you can go into crazy detail and spend a lot of time in flow charts and outlines and everything else, or you can just have a, a basic bullet point list of the important things that you know. I mean, so whether you do like to plan or you don't like to plan, there are different levels of, of research that you can put into it. But I, I do think that, that for emotions, I'm sorry, for emotional wounds and for the characterization, figuring out the character's backstory before you start it makes the writing process so much easier because you have a really clear idea from the get-go who my character is, what their tendencies are, how their emotional responses are typically going to be, um, what their, their go-to um, reactions are because you know who they are and kind of what their triggers and their sensitivities are from the past. So having that in place, um, I think it actually saves you a lot of time in the writing process because you get a lot of that in there that first draft without consciously thinking about it you just know the character and you know how they're going to react and so then you don't have to spend so much time in revision going back and plugging stuff in and making things consistent we actually have um we have a, our books but we also have a, a website called one stop for writers which takes all of the entry content from our books and it puts them into a, an online database where it's um, searchable and hyperlinked. And that to me is actually a really good tool for, um, for getting ready to write your story. Um, we have a, a tool that we created called a character builder that allows you to look at the different common aspects of characterization and it pulls information from our sources and you can choose, okay, here's some emotional wounds that I think work for my character. Here's what their outer motivation I think would be for the story. Um, here are their, their positive and negative traits that are going to be part of who they are. Here's their occupation, you know, and how that ties into things. And it, as you go through the, the different aspects of characterization, the tool collects the information that you tell it to collect, and it creates a, a character arc blueprint for you that basically says, here's what happened to my character in the past. 
this is the lie that they believe about themselves now that's causing them problems. It's created a, a lack in a basic human need that now has to be filled because that's how that works as human beings. So here's who they are at the start of the story. Um, this is gonna be their goal because they believe that's going to fill that inner need that they have. This is the story goal, the outer goal. And here's the fatal flaw that's gonna be a problem for them all along the way that they have to deal with by the end of the story. And I'm super, super excited about that tool because it basically takes a lot of the information that we've collected in various books and it brings it all into one database. And it's a smart tool that, that takes what you choose and creates a character arc that's personal to your character. Every wow. one that you do is gonna be different because it's pulling from that emotional wound that is a problem for them and from the character traits that they have and from the lie that they believe. So it's completely, each one is, is, is individualized to fit your character. Yeah. And that to me is, is hugely helpful when you're writing a story to have that information in place. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and this this has taken some amount of uh, sort of AI or something. I don't know how you describe it, but there's something going on in the background that, that puts this together. Have you, yeah, how did absolutely. you design that? Well, Angela and I were working on um, a couple of setting books and we were contacted by um, Lee Powell, who he was working on Scrivener. He was working on the, the um, the word version of Scribner. And he said, I'm a writer, you know, I, I really love your books. I think they're super helpful. I think we should have an online database where it's all in one spot. And we thought, okay, that would be great. And so we teamed up with him and created, it initially started as just a database for our thesaurus collection. And then as people were using it, they started asking us, well, what do I do with this information? Like, how do I tie these things together? And we thought, okay. So we started creating some worksheets, some templates, and some some little tools here and there. And it just has um, evolved into uh, a place that, that people can go and get mostly what they need in order to write their story. We have um, the character builder. We have a story mapping tool that helps people structure their stories um, using the three act structure. Uh, we have a scene mapping tool for people who really want to go into detail with their scenes and plan those out before they write. Uh, we have world building surveys for people to figure out the specifics of their world and, and the settings so that they can get those details straight. And we just have tried to take the information that we have written and apply it in a more practical way, I think, um, in this one online spot. Mm. That's kind of how it started. Yeah. And is there like a membership thing? I mean, obviously, you know, you can buy the books, but do you have like a, how does it work up beyond yeah. the books? The books are, are separate. And One Stop for Writers is a subscription-based website. So you can sign up for a month. You can sign up for a year. Uh, we do have a free two-week trial. So you can try the whole thing out for free and see if that's something that would um, benefit you. Um, but yeah, so people kind of have different options. You know, we have people who really like the books because they like doing it their own process. They like the, um, the instructive front matter to be able to refer back to that. And then you have people who, who really like having it all online on their computer, kind of while they're writing, they've got one stop for writers open in a tab and they're looking at different thesaurus entries or they're looking at their structure tool to see, you know, what's supposed to happen next. And so it's um, kind of different options for different writers. Great. And I'm just having a look at the prices because I know people will be asking uh, how much this. It looks like you can do it for as little as $9 for the month. Yeah, $9 a month. And then if you wanted to do a whole year, um, you know, the price is slightly discounted. It's $90 yep. for a year. Yeah. That's great. So this has blossomed from that early little um, uh, support really group that has. you had of writing that down. What a great idea, though, and uh, very, very helpful for this is, I mean, this is the bit, you know, it's very, very seldom an editor will come back and say, you're showing me far too much here. <laughs> He's going to mm. say you've skipped this. I don't know why they're, yeah. you know, why they're angry, and and it's what we struggle with a little bit as writers, particularly when you have, as you say, ultimately you are, you've you've identified all these emotions, right? But actually, mm. we write a lot about a few of the big ones, a lot, and I think that's right. one of the problems. You know, I joked Absolutely. earlier. There's only so many times someone can clench their fist, but that's a real problem for writers. If the person's angry several times in the book, or is in love several times in the book, you're going to run out of these adjectives. You're going to run out of these ways right. of describing it. So I think that's a really, really useful tool for people. Yeah, one of the things that Angela and I advocate is, is knowing your character's emotional range. 
So you want to know, that's one of the things you kind of want to figure out in advance if you can, is you want to know where they fall on that spectrum between reserved and demonstrative. You know, and if you know where they are, then you're going to kind of know what their reactions are going to be and what's normal. And then you know how to escalate them. You know, if something really big happens, um, you know kind of where they're going to go. The other part of that in terms of figuring out the emotional aspects of your story is making sure that you are, that your character is experiencing a, a wider range of emotion, like you mentioned, because if they're every scene, they're going from sadness to anger, to fear, to happiness, it's going to read flat after a while because there's nothing new really for the, for the reader. It's just the same thing over and over. So I love um, save the cat, the save the cat method of, you know, making, he, he has a method where you make, uh, you take a post-it for each scene and there are certain information that you record for each scene so that you can see your whole story and every scene, certain things that are happening. And one of the things that he says to do is to record the emotion change. Your character in every, she every scene should be starting with one emotion and not ending with the same emotion. Or if they do end with the same, it's gotta go somewhere in the middle. And so when you record each scene, okay, my character starts out um, happy and then they end up afraid. Uh, okay, so the next scene, he's gonna start out afraid and he's going to go to um, confusion or whatever it is. It shows you not only making sure that your scenes have that emotional progression, but it shows you your range of your character's emotion. If you see the same emotion over and over on your storyboard, then you know you've got to mix it up a little bit, you know, and you've got to get some different emotions in there. So that's a really good process that I, I like in terms of um, being a little more deliberate with uh, your character's emotions throughout the story and making sure, like you said, that they are experiencing a better range because that's the human experience, right? It's not, we don't just have four or five emotions. No. We have 130. Apparently. Yes, yes, apparently. <laughs> um, and it's also what makes a story is that yeah. you can't, you don't have a story much without that. And uh, funny enough, I was watching my we had a lockdown thing that lots of people have done i've done with my 17 uh, year old daughter is to watch the marvel films in cinematic universe order I'm really enjoying it i didn't really watch them before and i'm really enjoying it but one of them is the incredible hulk with ed norton in 2008 and there's a film that is a great example of why some films don't work and i said to mm. emma we talked about it afterwards she's obviously doing her a levels now in the uk and talked about it afterwards and even she was able to identify the what the character wanted at the beginning of the film was exactly the same at the end of the film. And it was exactly hmm. the same in the middle. He got chased around a bit, but that's basically what happened in that film. I don't understand how a multi-million dollar film gets made with that script going from hand to hand without somebody saying, hmm, there's no real character journey here. But it was right. obvious to me, now I think a bit more about it, why, and it did flop the film. We didn't do very well compared to the other Marvel films. It's very obvious to me now, it doesn't matter whether you're a superhero or or falling in love or playing baseball, there's got to be that change. Yeah, That's I what agree. it is. And Angela and I have conversations about this um, because there are films and stories that where there's not a big change with the character. You know, you look back and, and I find that they're mostly older, you know, like the early James Bond stuff from mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s. You know, he was the same in every story, same goal, you know, get the bad guy, get the girl, whatever. Not a lot of change. Indiana Jones, the, like the first Indiana Jones movie, same thing. Um, and I, th I think with action thriller stories in the past, that was like the goal. It, it was all about achieving the goal and not so much about the character achieving internal growth. Um, but the most compelling stories that I find are the ones that has that character going through some kind of change where they have to grow, they have to learn, they have to evolve or shift in some way. Um, because that's super compelling to us as people, yeah. you know, we, we all want to be better 10 years from now than we are today, you know? And so we want the same thing with the characters that we read and that we, that we get to know and that we admire, you know, we want them to be going through that growth. I think that's not a necessity because we, again, you do see in certain genres that there's less of that, but I think, I think it's, it's a really, really good idea and you should do it whenever you can. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, counter to that, I think was the, the first Thor film was either before or just after the Incredible Hulk, where at the beginning, Thor is young, impetuous, wants to start a war, fights with his dad, says you're doing it wrong. We've got to prove ourselves. That's the only way we're going to win. And 
within half an hour of that film, all of that being established, you're so engaged in it because you know he's hot headed, you know he's probably wrong, you know his dad's probably wise, but you know yeah. he's got to go through something to find all that out. And that's what you're there for, for the ride. Um, so I think that's probably a good idea as well. We talk about um, setting that up, that journey. It doesn't necessarily have to be. In fact, it's quite good for 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 to signpost ahead for people for readers to think, oh, this is probably where they need to go. You can of course surprise them here and there. Yeah. But I liked Thor. I liked knowing that we were on this journey with him, and he obviously was going to have to at some point learn the hard lesson that that's not yeah. how to get to what what he wanted to do. And of course, by the end of the film, he'd changed. Yeah, and I agree. Um... There is something, it's a fine line, that, that line of, um, of predictability. You know, you don't Consumer want your story reveal. to be super predictable where you know exactly what's going to happen. But it is satisfying, I think, more on a subconscious level when as a viewer or a reader, you can see, you know, you've figured it out. I've solved the mystery. I know what he needs to do. And then you know what to root for. You know, yes. you know how, what you really want to see. And then when he, you know, struggles and falls and makes stupid mistakes, you're like, mm. yeah. So I agree. I think that, um, having that, that certain level of, um, uh, obviousness is good to, to get people into it. Yeah. There's a trick. Well, Dan Brown does it brilliantly. I think in his books, mm. he has your, as a reader, you're always a couple of pages ahead of him, which is a clever trick. Because yeah. you, you kind of know what needs to happen and you get frustrated when things don't go their way because you're ahead of them. But um, it's a brilliant, brilliant writing style. And it's rewarded him very well financially, I believe. Yeah, so no he's, doubt. He's and I bit. do think that readers do, uh, they like to figure things out yeah. on their own. And that's part of why the show Don't Tell is so important. Because when you're telling it, you're just, you're telling them straight up front. And they aren't able to intuit anything or infer anything and there's something really satisfactory about reading a story and just putting the pieces together and putting the clues together to figure out what the character's feeling or what they really want, what their inner motivation is and why, you know, what, what the secret is that they've been hiding or that they are trying to protect, you know, whatever it is. I, I, I think that's a huge part of a good story success is, is letting readers figure things out as you go. And it's such a struggle because as authors, especially in the beginning, we doubt our ability to get that across. You know, we know how important it is, the emotion, you know, we got to get it right. So we just put it out there in a really heavy handed way. And it's, it, it doesn't provide the same experience. No. So it is a balancing act. Yeah. What to leave out, what to put in. We could right. talk for another hour on that subject alone, but uh, no it's, it's been gripping uh, talking to you, uh, Becca. Thank you so much indeed for coming on to the show. I, I feel that we do need to come back and probably we could just you know, choose one area, one book, one area, and just talk a, a bit about that because I think it could be like a little workshop if you don't mind at some point. I'm, yeah, that would be awesome. I'd love it. Be free consultation for me is the main thing uh, here, <laughs> but uh, everyone gets to listen Whatever. in. Uh, You're listen the in host. As well. I mean, you yeah, can do exactly. I'm going to get something out of this. Um, yeah, <laughs> brilliant, Becca. Thank you so much. Just give the website another plug. Yes. Yeah, so our our website is onestopforwriters.com, and our blog is writershelpingwriters.net. Brilliant. And of course, the books are at every good uh, online bookstore. Yep. And you can find them at our blog on the bookstore page. Super. Becca, thank you so much indeed for joining us from Jupiter. And uh, we'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you so much. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. Becca Puglisi. I love that name. And um, a really good set of books that she's done. Really useful for us authors. And yeah, it's been, that's been my, I'm going to use the J word, that's been my biggest writing journey, I think, is understanding that you don't tell the reader what to think. You don't tell the reader someone's angry. You paint the picture and allow the reader to enjoy coming up with that themselves. And it's difficult, particularly for first-time authors, I think, tend to overwrite it. But that's a really useful tool from Becca and her, her co-author colleagues. Absolutely. Yeah, it's... um. It is. You get better with that kind of stuff with with practice, obviously, as as with most things. Um, but yeah, I remember reading the first drafts of your book and thinking you don't. You got about well, it, it was too long, wasn't it? But there was quite a lot that we could yes. we could strip out, which is obviously that's been done now, and it's a much better book because of it. Yeah, it was. You know, so it was a process to go through, and I'm I'm definitely somebody who learns by doing something, getting it wrong, and then 
And then I, I can't necessarily read a book on how to do something, an academic approach, and then, oh, I'm going to do it this way. It's I have to get my hands dirty, learn on the job. It's how I do everything. I do my Facebook ads I've learned through trial and error. Um, but uh, I would, it's funny enough, reading the books now that I've read it, so I'm now reading Save the Cat, which is a really uh, gripping thriller. No, it's not a thriller. Um, it's uh, you know, a description on how stories work, one of the many books on that subject. It makes much more sense to me now that I sort of know a little bit of what I'm talking about. I couldn't just sit sit there and read that academically. Some people, I think, can. Um, but yeah, good. We're all on a journey. Mark, you can't get away from the J word. I'm, I'm not on a journey. I'm on a voyage. <laughs> just a thesaurus away exactly. from a journey. I'm on a voyage yeah. of discovery. <laughs> Good. Sounds a fantastic voyage. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed. Mark, is there anything else to add this week? Um, no. I, mean, I had my jab on Friday. I probably mentioned on Thursday, mm. actually. And then I, I you were pretty every, rough, weren't you? I was pretty rough, yeah. I was, Friday night and Saturday was pretty dreadful, actually. Um, and it's funny, Lucy, my wife, didn't have any effects at all. She was like, I didn't even know I had the jab. My mum, my dad, my father, my brother... Um, but I was laid up in bed on Saturday and felt pretty rough. And, and I feel fine now, but um, yeah, it was, wasn't the best weekend mm. I've ever had. But at least, you know, Which one did you ha- AstraZeneca. Which one did you have? AstraZeneca. Oh, yeah, I, I had that. Yeah. I was a bit tired the next day, but yeah, it's really affecting people differently. But um, mm. but I think, I think as you said in one of your social media posts, you'd rather have a rough day and a half than oh God, the alternative, yeah. which no, is no, a it's no, pandemic we can't get away from. It's absolutely, absolutely no question. I'd rather I'd do that if I felt like that for a week. Um, yeah, rather than get COVID and long COVID potentially and all that kind of nightmare. No, I'm much happier to yeah. have it in my arm and I'll be ready for the next one in June. Bring it on. Yeah, me too. Get your jabs if you get to get your chance soon. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to Becca Puglisi being our guest this week. And uh, we look forward to announcing who our book lab participant is in the next couple of weeks. And we'll get busy with that in the background. Until then, all that remains for me to say is it is a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.